resilience programs in your department. I'm your instructor, Rick Campos. So what are we gonna to cover today? Well, today we're gonna to cover resiliency in your department. We're gonna look at the overview of the scope of the problem, the agency's culture and its impact on whether or not providers accept help, reducing employee stress, practices that provide support to those dealing with mental health issues, identifying employees in crisis and assisting employees in crisis. Now let's look at the scope of the problem. First responders experience rates of depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other mental health issues that may lead to suicidal ideations, suicide attempts, and death by suicide in far greater percentages than the, of the general population. Not only does the exposure to acute traumatic events play a role in the origin of these disorders, but occupation and environmental conditions where first responders work on a regular basis are also contributing factors. Now, if the exposure to critical events and occupational conditions is enough, they have been linked to the inflammatory activity and modification of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, or HPA. Because first responders experience many of these incidents on a regular basis, there is a significantly higher rate of mental health issues in first responders when compared to the general population. If you look here on your screen, you'll see how first responders develop serious mental health issues. Well, first, there's the exposure. Exposure to death, grief, injury, pain, and loss. Now, you couple that with demanding schedules, physically challenging jobs, and a lack of safety and security. Now, what this can result in is emotional trauma. And like with any trauma, if left untreated, it can lead to devastating effects. This trauma can lead to depression, anxiety, PTSD, suicidal ideation, and suicide. Despite a clear need for mental health services, not all first responders have access to resources like employee assistance programs and counseling. And to make things worse, utilization of these resources that exist remain an ever-increasing concern. A 2016 survey from the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians found that 37% of respondents which were majority paramedics and EMTs, said the agency they worked for did not provide mental health services. 76% responded no when asked if their employee measured the success of the programs it offered. 46% were with a provider agency that did not offer health and wellness services. The effectiveness of already limited resources is further undercut by the underutilization of services by first responders often for fear of employer reprisal or retaliation. It's quoted as saying, most of the people in my organization do not feel comfortable using any service provided by the organization for fear that the information will come back and be used against us in the future. And this is from one respondent in the NAEMT survey. However, when the services are utilized, most responders find them to be worth their time. One survey regarding mental health services found that 86% of EMS providers that experience critical stress. So one survey regarding mental health services found 86% of EMS providers experienced critical stress. And out of that, 18% participated in a critical incident stress management program. Out of that, 11% did the same with an EAP. However, of those attending a SISM session, 63% said their experience was very or extremely helpful. 53% said the same after attending an EAP session. Raising awareness of available resources is critical to improving coverage of first responders' mental health needs. However, institutional change also needs to occur. As we see here, 56% of respondents in a culture that had no encouragement or support contemplated suicide. And out of that 56%, 12% attempted it. First responders from a culture of full support and encouragement still had higher than normal activity and suicidal tendencies, but with substantially smaller percentages. Thoughts about suicide dropped by 50%. And attempted suicide dropped 
by 75%. 23% thought about suicide. Now 4% attempted. That's still too much, but you could see how help and support can start making these numbers get lower and lower. Now, management should be aware of the fact that their intervention matters. Even if that intervention is simply making your team aware that help is available or creating a culture where it is accepted and encouraged to ask for and receive help whenever and as often as needed to care for their mental health status. In this climate where no one talks about mental health, first responders will feel isolated and fail to access the help that they truly need. This silence can be interpreted by many as a negative judgment, a negative judgment about mental health issues. Let's consider your department's culture. Let's ask ourselves some hard questions. How do you deal with critical events? In what ways do you promote open communication about mental health issues? What resources are available and promoted for your team? Are mental health issues treated like a secret? And when do supervisors talk to their team about seeking treatment? How does your department address barriers to your team receiving mental health treatment? An article in the National Academy Association magazine quoted an officer saying, when I was involved in my first shooting, I was cleared right away. And I wasn't given any administrative time off. Basically, they bought you a beer and told you that you were a hero. And you had to deal with it all on your own. And, and there weren't any department resources, not even a chaplain to talk to. First responder leaders should be changing, changing the culture and speaking more openly about mental health issues. While there is still a lot of work to do to ensure that all our first responders feel comfortable and even encourage to access essential mental health services whenever they are needed. Do not underestimate the impact of leadership, encouraging and providing access to mental health services. Now this can include critical incident stress teams, peer support teams, employee assistance programs, insurance coverage, and community resources. These are the hard questions we need to ask ourselves about the culture that we are developing in our agencies. One that stands out is, if someone seeks help, is it treated as a secret? Are they afraid to come and talk to us about any mental health issues for fear that it's going to hurt their career? Because they shouldn't. Now, your department must find and discuss ways to reduce or eliminate common barriers to the men and women in your department. And this will encourage those who need it to access mental health services. Possible barriers that keep your staff from accessing the help they need must be addressed. Barriers to receiving mental health care are not uncommon in the general population and are even more significant in the life of a first responder. In a review of studies assessing barriers to care among the first responders, 33.1% of participants reported experiencing some barrier to receiving treatment for PTSD. Now, these common barriers can include a lot of things, just a few, such as difficult schedules, inability to take time off work, confidentiality concerns, unsure of where to seek help, and fear of negative impact on career. So let's ask, what policies does your department have to eliminate these barriers? And what do you do as a manager to help alleviate barriers your team may face? What cultural trains have you fostered to eliminate barriers? Leadership within your department must be more vocal and encourage everyone to seek help on a regular basis. Setting the time within your department is essential to creating a culture of supporting mental health. A report published by the International Association of Police Chiefs explained that hearing from the chief personally and candidly carries a tremendous amount of weight. In particular, police chiefs or others who have triumphed over their own mental health issues should champion this subject and share their own success stories. Because if we know 
that someone we hold to a higher standard has gone through it and has succeeded, the employees will know also that they can succeed as well. How vocal is your leadership? Does your department encourage strategies to prevent a mental health crisis? Does your department discuss openly the options available for someone seeking help? Does your department share openly difficult experiences that were treated by mental health professionals or is it seen as a secret? Is there a stigma around seeking mental health treatment? We need to encourage the peer-to-peer -peer relationships and facilitate them throughout our departments. Now, peer-to-peer -peer relationships are vitally important to the culture of your department, of my department. Being open helps to eliminate stigma around seeking mental health treatment and help. It also bolsters success stories for hope and recovery for others who may experience similar challenges. It is up to management within your department to facilitate and encourage open sharing of these success stories. Now let's reduce employee stress. Well, first of all, we need to understand that stress is a normal occurrence throughout life. Everyone experiences it. And more than that, it is expected in life and it is inescapable in emergency work. Stress is the mind and body response to a physical or emotional challenge, and it occurs when demands are out of balance with our ability to cope. And it goes without saying that not everyone experiences and responds to stress in the same way. Now, we should consider three types of stress. We have the day-to-day -day stress. Now, this is the baseline stress. Now, this baseline stress is caused by various everyday sources of tension in our lives, personal, family, financial, social, and may be increased by changes in our environment, such as a change in our routines. The change in routines that when responders get to the field working with new people and managing new information. We talk about cumulative stress or strain. This results from the accumulation of various stresses inherent to the job. This stress may not be induced from one-time event, but rather from chronic and cumulative demanding environments. Then there's critical incident stress or shock. And this can result when people are exposed to extreme or traumatic events outside the realm of normal or outside the everyday human experience. All three of these types of stress, day-to-day, -day, cumulative and critical incident, can lead to PTSD if severe and chronic enough. Treating these stresses in a timely and effective manner is essential for the health of your employees. Finding ways to help your team reduce stress is vital to maintaining a healthy balance and ensuring a mentally healthy atmosphere. Taking just one of the steps below will help relieve stress and build healthy habits. Many of these stress reducing actions can be put into practice through both culture and policy in your department. Others can be supported and encouraged in your department through assistance offered in the culture of your department. So here's some practices and policies your department can include. Take time off when needed. Mandatory time off immediately following a critical incident. Mandatory mental health check-ins every six months and following critical incidents. SISM interventions following a critical incident. Limiting working hours to no longer than 12-hour shifts positive peer support teams or programs. Here's some individual stress management techniques that we can use. Getting an adequate sleep, finding a hobby, eat healthy foods, practice meditation such as yoga or breathing, relaxation techniques, connect with personal spiritual practice, and limit caffeine and alcohol. While there are many different approaches to addressing mental health, Health issues. There is no central source of information that allows for the sharing or knowledge, resources, or training across first responders agencies. For this reason, in December of 2015, the BC First Responders Mental Health Committee was formed. The BCFRMHC is a multi agency committee that res represents labor and management from urban and rural communities and works collaboratively to provide leadership and recommended practices promoting positive mental health for first responders in different organizations. There are six core areas that were identified where department leadership can focus on practices that promote positive mental health. I bet you're gonna ask, what are those six? Here are those six. 
These are the six practices, and they include strategy and program development, workplace campaigns, education and training, mental health providers, data and evaluation, and other. Let's first talk about strategy and program development. With these, we want to ensure that leaders clearly support improving mental health in the workplace. Adopt a management system approach to mental health in the workplace. Develop strategies, programs, and policies in collaboration with all workplace stakeholders and tailor them to the specific workplace. Ensure strategies that focus on mental health broadly. Now, as we look at the workplace campaigns, we want to implement anti-stigma campaigns to ensure employees seek and receive the help they need. We want to use workplace champions to reinforce anti-stigma messages. We want to educate and train. And in this topic, we want to improve employee resiliency through training to help prevent mental health disorders. We want to improve mental health literacy of employees through training to help reduce the stigma. We want to equip supervisors and line managers with skills to identify symptoms and to support employees. And finally, equip families. Equip the families of first responders with the knowledge and skills to support their loved ones. Now, as we develop mental health providers, we want to understand a few things. We want to ensure that mental health providers understand our culture, the first responder culture. Establish a network of mental health providers that can utilize intervention and treatments. Provide access to a range of support options. Create an in-house peer support service. Provide peer support services to families and retired first responders. Recognize the signs and symptoms of potential mental health issues early and take action. Provide managers and supervisors with access to mental health experts. Ensure employees have excellent mental health care benefits. Incorporate critical incident stress debriefing and diffusing in the workplace. Ensure return to work plans are flexible, but also collaborative. Maintain privacy and confidentiality at all times. So here's some practices. Practices that provide support for those dealing with mental health issues. Data and evaluation. Use data to identify key mental health issues in the workplace. Prepare the evaluation before you begin. Like a survey. As we deal with the other broad term here, we want to ensure claims process are clear and don't add further to mental stress. Provide self-care tools and form partnerships with other organizations and first responder groups. Now, one of the biggest things that we can do as leaders is identify, identifying employees in crisis. A mental health crisis is any situation in which a person's behavior puts them at risk of hurting themselves or others and or prevents them from being able to care for themselves or function effectively in the community. Mental illnesses are medical conditions, and these medical conditions disrupt a person's feelings, thoughts, mood, ability to relate to others, and daily functioning. Symptoms of mental illness will vary from one person to another. Additionally, each person responds differently to stressors. There are also may be other conditions that present further complicated mental health illnesses. It is important to understand that mental health crises stem from underlying mental health issues. But having mental health issues does not always lead to a crisis. The best way to avoid a crisis is getting help as soon as symptoms are present. So what are some general mental health issues for first responders? So we deal with so many. Some here are compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, depression, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, substance abuse, co-occurring disorders. Here are some of the common symptoms of compassion fatigue. Chronic physical and emotional exhaustion, depersonalization of a patient, feelings of inequity toward the therapeutic or caregiver relationship, irritability, feelings of self-contempt, difficulty sleeping, weight loss, and headaches. Now here are some of the symptoms of secondary trauma, hypervigilance, hopelessness, inability to embrace complexity, anger and cynicism, sleeplessness, fear, chronic exhaustion, 
physical ailments, minimizing guilt, and depression. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, has, again, many different symptoms. Here are the most common flashbacks. Physiological responses, such as rapid breathing, sweating, increased heart rate. Nightmares, difficulty concentrating, difficulty remembering traumatic events, being easily startled, intense anger responses, sleep disorders, hypervigilance, and emotional numbness and avoidance of places, people, and activities that are reminders of the trauma. As a person becomes anxious as an anxiety attack, they may display muscular tension, restlessness, fatigue, or even problems with concentration. Now, fear and anxiety can be differentiated in four different domains, such as the duration of emotional experience, temporal focus, specific threat, and the motivated direction, assisting employees in crisis, because that's what we need to do, assist. So when a member of our team is experiencing a mental health crisis or showing signs of suicidal behavior, remember three things. These are three important things, and one is take it seriously, two is ask questions, and three, get help. Because sometimes we're their best advocate. There are a few direct actions that we take if there is danger of immediate harm in the wake of a mental health crisis. These could be to take a person to the nearest ER. Medical staff can help you deal with the crisis and keep the person safe. Following an assessment by a clinical professional, the ER will determine potential care options. If they're unable to take that person to the ER, contact a crisis line. It is important to remember that crisis services are meant to help stabilize those who are in crisis to get immediate help they need in a safe setting. Not all mental health issues will include plans or a possibility of harming themselves or others. And there are many other ways in which we could support and help those who are struggling. If the person is not currently seeing a provider, help make the first appointment with a private practitioner, clinic, or other outpatient provider. This is best when the situation is not urgent and a person is in the early stages of an impending crisis. Call your local service. These services offer intensive short-term counseling to help stabilize and prevent a crisis. And by all means, do not leave suicidal individuals alone until help is available. As you can see here, there are barriers to obtaining mental health. And as leaders, we need to be aware of these barriers to help break them down. We have cultural, lack of awareness, pragmatic barriers. Now, treating trauma exposure to first responders because of the ongoing exposure, departments may need a variety of mental health services before, during, and after critical incidents. Ideally, training will begin during the training academy and continue throughout the professional's career. So let's discuss after a crisis. Remember that recovery will be a process that requires ongoing care, treatment, and support. Every plan for recovery will differ from person to person. Being a support to one another following a crisis will vary depending on the needs of that person. The most important thing is to make sure the person receiving support feels comfortable reaching out to continue their recovery. Remember that setbacks and bumps in recovery, it's normal. We must remain supportive after a crisis because it is essential to preventing another crisis. After a mental health crisis, mental health professionals should create a treatment plan and a safety plan with each patient. A safety plan is a tool that helps the patient to identify resources they can use if the suicidal urge or mental health crisis occurs again. Now we mentioned safety plan. Well, let's discuss what a safety plan is and the importance of having one. A safety plan is a tool that helps the patient to identify resources they can use if the suicidal urge occurs again. Patients can list their coping strategies after each element. Elements of a safety plan can include the following. Warning signs that a crisis may be developing. Internal coping strategies. 
things I can do to take my mind off the problem without contacting another person. And this could be relaxation techniques or a physical activity, people in social settings that provide distraction, people whom I can ask for help, professionals or agencies I can contact during a crisis. This could be a therapist, an emergency contact, AA, NA, or PACT, or a team worker. And making the environment safe. As leaders, we are doing our employees a disservice by not allowing them to engage in their mental health issues. This course attempted to instruct how to develop resiliency in your department of first responders by identifying the scope of the problem, discussing the culture of first responder agencies, and the impact of whether or not providers accept health. How to reduce employee stress, best practices in providing support for those dealing with a mental health crisis, how to identify an employee in crisis, and finally, how to assist employees in crisis. By now, as a first responder, you should be able to understand and accept the basics of these principles. By having this understanding as a first responder, you will be able to provide a higher level of service to those in your responsibility. Identify critical issues experienced by team members and support them accordingly. And lastly, engaging to develop further resilience in yourself. I want to thank you so much for joining me on this course. Remember, you are your best advocate.